Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to be talking about container gardens. We'd like to thank Tom Sinclair for liking and sharing the podcast. In ancient Egypt, they were doing container gardening. There's, really? there's carvings on some of the temples around 1500 BC showing plants growing out of pots. Hmm. And then in ancient Rome, they say that container garden was very popular. They had a lot of window boxes in a lot of the structures. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the large homes had center areas that were open in the house where they had all types of pots for gardens. Interesting. In ancient times, historians think that King Nebuchadnezzar built the hanging gardens in ancient Babylon about 600 BC. Hmm. Did although, I spell that? Although, <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> but but historians don't know whether it was real or not. But a lot of the writers said that they had these huge stone pillars and they had containers on the top of it and all these plants would, would cascade down from this. Mm, nice. What's nice about container gardening is that you can do it in most locations with very little space. Right. So for most plants, you, the, the key thing is to know whether you have a few hours of direct sunlight where you plan on putting these pots. Mm -hmm. So you don't need a big backyard. You can do it on a balcony, you can do it on a patio. And then if you're interested to see whether you're actually interested in tending for a garden, <laughs> you can kind of test it out in a pot rather than dig it up the backyard. Right. And, and then you say, you know what, this is a drag. This I hate. This is a lot of work. <laughs> I, I hate this. And now you've got to put down new grass seed, mm -hmm. get all that out of there. It's great for beginners, too, because you can really get a feel for the plants that you're actually good at growing. Yeah, we found out last year we're not good at growing some things. <laughs> yeah, or putting too many things together right. is, is a bad thing, or too close together. With containers, you're going to have less disease and pests, less weeds, easier to water, and then large containers. Well, you can actually stage large and small containers, so you can use it in landscape areas for decoration, mm -hmm. and then you've got food. Mm. And you can use almost anything mm -hmm. as a container. So. Well, when we were doing some research, I found some pictures of like people using like rubber boots, like <laughs> rain boots. <laughs> Crazy. Huh? They were hanging up like flowers and their herbs, like on a fence. Right. It looked super cute. They were all different colors. And um, there was another picture of like a radio flyer wagon. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Very cool. So it was very decorative with flowers and pots and. Right. And, and little stones, mm -hmm. decorative stones in there. So it, you know, it's it's easy to create a container to grow something. Most of the pros say if you're going to use a window box, they're recommending 8 inches deep by 8 inches wide for the healthiest plants. For pots, 10 inches wide and 12 inches deep does a nice job. Tomatoes and cucumbers like 20 inches wide. And a lot of the pros were saying that if you base your size on a 5-gallon bucket, it's going to be a good rule of thumb for container gardens because mm. you can grow just about anything in that size. And then you need to have that container with drainage holes to make sure the roots and the plants stay healthy. You don't want your roots waterlogged. Right. For your larger pots, you can elevate them on a block of wood or a stone so that the water can drain out. So when you're watering it, you soak it, you wait until you see the water coming out, and then you know you've soaked it down to the roots, mm -hmm. and then you want it to, to dry out. You can get different types of material. So clay and terracotta, they're very porous. They allow the roots to dry out. You have to be careful, though. They're breakable. Mm -hmm. And you, a lot of the pros were saying that they like plastic because plastic doesn't dry out so fast. You don't have to water it as often. Mm -hmm. And so they like taking a plastic container and putting it inside a clay or terracotta pot. Oh, that's interesting. So, so it looks decorative, and you don't have to water as much because mm -hmm. that clay dries out fairly quickly, and especially depending on where you are. If you're in a very hot area of the country and it's very windy, right. it's going to dry out faster. And then some of these have built-in saucers you right. know, that will hold the extra water, and then it can kind of you know, stay a little mo more moist. You do have to be careful with those because some of them, you have to pull them apart and drill out the drainage holes. Yeah, it's smart to look. It's crazy that some of the pots you'll find in hardware stores or the, the home centers, it has like an indentation where the hole right. should be, right. but it's not knocked out. So mm -hmm. you either have to drill it or knock it out. So definitely look at the bottom of your pots. You need to make sure it's open so that water can escape. You can get resin or fiberglass, and these are made to look like stone or clay, mm -hmm. and there's a wide variety of styles, colors, and also prices. 
and the resin, you can really get them very lightweight, yeah, so it's easy, nice. easy to move around. With wood, they can be durable if they're made out of redwood or cedar, mm -hmm. but you want to look at the construction, the thickness of them. And then they said that there's a problem with some of these, depending on where you're purchasing it. Some are from treated wood that you do not want to use for vegetables and herbs <laughs> because it can absorb some of those chemicals. Nice. And then there's metal, stone, there's concrete, you know, very durable, mm -hmm. but some of these are very heavy. So they're almost like, you, you know, know. Concrete generally yeah. is kind of heavy. <laughs> you put it down once and that's <laughs> it. Where some of the, like the resin ones, you know, you can kind of shift it right. and, and see where, where it grows the best. And then think about the color. What's wild is a bunch of these articles I was reading, they say that it makes a significant difference in the soil temperature. The darker colors absorb heat and it mm -hmm. can really dry out and damage the roots. Oh, it's something you really don't think about, do Yeah, it? yeah, weird. Hmm. In general, when you're placing these pots, you want a location that has about six hours of direct sun a day mm -hmm. for most vegetables and herbs. And then with these pots, less wind is usually better because it dries out the leaves and the pots. Right. So you know, it dries out that moisture. So make sure that you have it in a protected area if possible. Mm -hmm. It's going to do better. When you're filling these pots, you don't want to use traditional soil or topsoil in your containers because it's too heavy. It can cause disease and insect problems. And a good potting mix is going to be very light, which is going to allow good drainage, good root growth, and air movement. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these quality container mixes are considered soilless because hmm. there's no soil in it at all. Yeah, but it, it still looks like dirt. <laughs> right, right. And you're looking on the package, material like compost, seaweed, peat moss, peat humus... It can say pine bark or composted forest material. Mm -hmm. They also add vermiculite or perlite, and that's going to keep it fluffier and also hold moisture. When you're looking for a potting mix, if you have a lot of containers that you're going to be filling, you can also get bales of mm -hmm. this. So for your garden tower, so on your balcony, you've got the garden tower. And yes, it, I know. And, and it's it, called the garden tower, too. <laughs> so it needed a lot mm -hmm. to, to fill this thing. I got one of these bales. It's a big square bale that expands twice its size. So very lightweight. It was inexpensive. And so it was a blend of uh, sphagnum peat moss, peat humus. They had a little bit of limestone and perlite in there. And then they also had a very small amount of a slow-release fertilizer. And so you cut open the top of this and you take out a little bit of a time and you fluff it up right. and it expands and just very easy to use. It was pretty inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And so it's a nice option to think about if you have a lot of containers. Much easier to carry it too. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was really simple rather than <laughs> filling a cart with all these bags and right. trying to juggle that. And then especially if you're on a second or third floor right, yeah. and this is where your garden is going to be. And one cool one that I saw that we haven't used, and we saw this at a bunch of the hardware shows, is Fox Farm. Yeah. And they have all these organic mixes. And, and I would say just go to their website, too, because the packaging just, on their bottles yeah. are just, and all their products are just fantastic. Yeah, they're great. And they have one that's called Lucky Dog. Mm -hmm. So this is a mix for container gardens, and it has peat moss, perlite. It has beneficial microbes in there and earthworm castings. Mm. So it's a really nice organic blend. And they, like you say, they have great packaging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's wild about these beneficial microbes and organisms is they attach themselves to the root system of the plants and they hold on to moisture and they break down nutrients mm -hmm. so it's easier absorbed by the plants. Scientists have found that these fungi in, in the soil, they colonize on the plant roots and they channel nutrients to the plant. And they found that some of these fungus allow the plants to communicate with other plants. No way. So they can warn each other against pests and diseases. Hmm. So they, Here comes a deer. So, <laughs> God, hide. <laughs> Fold up. When attacked with by aphids, scientists found that beans transmit a signal through these microbes and fungi to tell other plants to produce these defensive chemicals. Huh. And then another study showed that tomato plants can warn other plants to activate their defenses. Wow, it's kind of spooky, <laughs> isn't it? It's like science fiction. <laughs> Some of the easiest plants to grow in containers are tomatoes, and you would want to use something around a five gallon container and 12 inches deep for tomatoes. And you're looking for the dwarf varieties. A few of the top rated ones were the patio variety, Tiny Tom, Window Box Roma, Celebrity, Rutgers, Pixie, and Tumbling Tom. Mm -hmm. And it makes a big difference because this was something we, we weren't exactly successful with. Right. Because <laughs> you got a variety of plants. Yeah, last who knew? Year. It's like, okay, you've got a container, you right. wanted some and vegetables. And I'm like, okay, and get us let's some get tomatoes. Some. 
So you got us a like a wide variety of tomatoes, and some of them did nothing all year. Yeah, it's good to do some research before <laughs> yeah. you, you do stuff like this and spend a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some stuff was expensive. And with tomatoes, it's smart to get some type of cage or stake so you're going to provide support right. for the fruit. And with the stakes, you can use fabric or ties to hold the branches as it starts to get fruit on them. Mm-hmm. And they have these new Velcro ties that they're they're kind of thick and soft. They're elastic, right. so it's not going to damage the plant. With cabbage and lettuce, they say that two gallons or larger and about eight inches deep will mm-hmm. do fine. But again, the larger the better. The larger your pots, the easier it is. But a minimum of cabbage and lettuce would be two gallons. And they say for cabbage, you look for a baby head and modern dwarf with the lettuce, ruby, and salad bowl. Mm. Strawberries, believe it or not, a bunch of these sites say that strawberries do really well in containers. Really? And they said get the biggest pot you can. Radishes, cucumbers, and peppers all do well in two or three gallon size, all of them about eight inches deep. And then green beans, beets, carrots, and onion do well in two gallon. Again, around eight inches deep seems to be about Mm -hmm. the depth that you'd want for most of these vegetables. And then if you're thinking about herbs, parsley, chive, basil, cilantro, oregano, thyme, all these can be grown in small pots, but they want about six inches. Mm -hmm. If you're going to plant multiple plants in one container, it's nice to match the watering needs Mm -hmm. of them. And then also, if you want to work with the tallest plants in the back and work forward to the smallest plants, especially if they're staging this Mm -hmm. in landscape areas, you know, for a nice visual effect. You should probably label these containers, too. Yeah, label them, and then again... Because they all kind of look the same at the beginning. (laughs) When you're getting ready to plant your stuff, you want to first fill your containers with whatever your potting mix is, just under the top, and then soak it with water so it settles. A lot of times, depending on how fluffy it is, it's going to settle quite a bit, Mm -hmm. and then you're going to refill it. Keep it about two inches from the top. And then you can either use seeds or seedlings. If you're planting seedlings, you want to make a hole to fit that root ball in. So you're going to take them out of the container, whatever they're grown in. And you want to keep the top of that root ball above the height of the potting mix Mm -hmm. because it it needs to have sunlight and air on that. For seeds, you want to read the package because there's all different types of depth and spacing. Which we did a terrible job of this last year. <laughs> Just pour them in. I mean, how can you screw up, I figure? You yeah, know. well, we did because none of them grew. <laughs> and then if you've mulched your leaves, so if you listen to our podcast about mulching your leaves, mm-hmm. you can put a thin layer on top of your potting mix, and that's going to hold in the moisture and actually add nutrients as that decomposes. Mm-hmm. When you're watering your plants, in general, it's you can use your finger as kind of a guide. You can push your finger into your potting mix up to your second knuckle, and if it's wet, you don't need to water. But if it's dry, you should water and water deeply. Mm-hmm. Most of the pros are saying you should water till water runs out of the bottom of your pot, right. and that way you make sure that you're getting water right down to the roots, and then you're encouraging deep root growth, mm-hmm. which is much healthier for the plants. And depending on the daily temperature and wind, you're probably going to have to water about once a day in the summer. But you do need to keep checking this. Yeah, absolutely. Because we had a big learning curve with our watering (laughs) technique. Yeah, who knew? (laughs) Who knew they needed a drink so often? And you get a feel. It's interesting as you kind of, you know, if this is a a new hobby, you can see the leaves start to wilt and start looking weird. Yeah, we're killing them slowly. (laughs) (laughs) So if you've got a lot of containers or really large ones, you can rather than taking a watering can and going out to the pots, you can... It's because that's really hard work. <laughs> yes. So I would set up a drip irrigation system, mm-hmm. and you can add this system so it screws on to the, your hose silcock outside. And this hose... Does anybody know what a silcock is besides your, out, your outdoor spigot. Mm-hmm. You can hook this hose to this, and you run this hose exactly where you need it. So you can run it up to your container, and then you put these little sprinkler heads, you pierce the hose, mm-hmm. and so now you're just putting water right there. So it's very, very efficient and very easy. So now you can just turn this on and leave it on for a specific amount of time, or you can add a timer to this. Right. And this is great for all your landscaping areas. Yeah, it does a nice job. One of the highest rated systems is from DIG, and that's D-I-G. Because how else would you spell that? <laughs> it could be D-I-G-G <laughs> or G-G-E or something crazy. <laughs> Another thing you can do is just bury a water bottle halfway into your potting mix and poke some holes into the bottom of it. And then, you know, you leave the top open, you fill that with water, Mm -hmm. and then you can walk away. And that way it slowly puts water into it. The Plant Nanny, we've talked about before, we saw that at the hardware shows. It's a terracotta steak. 
mm-hmm. that you fill with water and it slowly puts water into your containers. And Fan Sheng Chi Shu in 30 BC loved doing that. He would take clay pots and bury them in his gardens, and that's what he would. He also loved worm castings. Well, who I was, doesn't? I was, re- I was reading. I know we do. <laughs> if you have hanging pots, you can use watering wands. Mm-hmm. And then you can also use a moisture meter. If you don't like sticking your finger into this potting mix, silly. You can you can use this moisture meter, and then you're not guessing either. So the ideal moisture range for most plants is forty to seventy percent. Mm-hmm. But and your finger's not going to tell you that. No, <laughs> unless you're really really professional. But it's healthy for these most plants for, to let the soil dry out and the roots dry out before mm-hmm. the next watering. So when the water drops to about ten percent it's time to water again. And some of the top rated moisture meters were from Dr. Meter, Mudder, M-U-D-D-E-R, Mosser Lees, M-O-S-S-E-R-L-E-E-S, and Luster Leaf. And some of these do other things besides just measure the moisture in the soil. They'll also check for pH balance. Right, which is important for some plants. For the healthiest plants, you'd want to use some type of fertilizer, and some of these fertilizers are specific to the plant, like tomato, Right. and you can get liquid or granular, and look at the labels, because the frequency is different depending on the fertilizer. Mm-hmm. Some are a slow release, you know, it can be once every four weeks or six weeks. Some of the top-rated fertilizers were miracle Grow, Vigoro, Espoma, Job's Organics, Dr. Earth, and Pennington. Mm-hmm. I was looking at the label from the Pennington Vegetable and Tomato Fertilizer, Mm -hmm. and they say it's a fish fertilizer. So they use fish and kelp Mm -hmm. in that fertilizer. And then Dr. Earth, their organic tomato, vegetable, and herb fertilizer, they use Alaskan fish bone meal, feather meal, kelp, alfalfa, and they say they have five strains of beneficial microbes. That's nice. So it increases the health of the mix. Mm -hmm. Did you know the pilgrims used to just bury fish and... As yeah. a fertilizer? Yeah, that's funny, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, did you see that tangent? I nice. came up with that. Nice. And they learned it from the Indians. <laughs> who used to tell them, hey, why don't you why smoke some you, of that... You're uh... stealing my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the stories where the Indians said, smoke some of this poison ivy, mm-hmm. and it'll make you more resistant to it. Nice. <laughs> If you're looking for a fertilizer that's certified organic, you're looking for the OMRI label, Mm -hmm. and that's the Organic Materials Review Institute. And this is a nonprofit organization that does an independent review of these products. Right. Because what's wild is I saw the ABC World News report of the top 12 fruits and vegetables with the highest pesticide amounts. Mm -hmm. And the number one is strawberries. That's scary. And then you have apples, nectarines, peaches, celery, grapes, cherries, spinach, tomatoes, bell peppers, and then they specified cherry tomatoes and cucumbers. And a few of these experts were saying they should add leafy greens and hot peppers Mm -hmm. to this. And they're saying that you should definitely wash your produce thoroughly right. if you're picking this up. So this is actually a report that's done by several websites every year called the Dirty Dozen. They test all these uh, produce and then they rank them yeah, on what tested great. And, and so there's also the clean 15. Right. <laughs> that's, that's great. It's funny, the University of Washington did a study of people who buy organic produce and they said that their urine samples had significantly less traces of mm-hmm. insecticides. The fruits and vegetables that are on the Dirty Dozen list okay. tested at 89% of having five or more pesticides on it, Amazing, which is huh? crazy. Where on the clean list, like avocados, 1% of them tested of having two or more pesticides in yeah, it. Yeah, So it's a huge difference. And then you also have to worry about bacteria. So the CDC says that more than 9 million people get sick every year from dirty food. Ugh, scary. So they're suggesting to wash your food thoroughly. Mm-hmm. And a couple things I recommend. One is to put in into a spray bottle, one tablespoon of lemon juice, two tablespoons of distilled white vinegar, and then a cup of cold water. You shake this up, and then you soak your produce with it. You spray them down, and you let it set for a minute or so, Mm -hmm. and then rinse it very thoroughly. And then for like lettuce and cabbage, they want you to take a bowl, put a cup of white vinegar and three Mm -hmm. cups of water, and just let it soak for two or three minutes, and then wash it. These researchers found that it killed 98% of the bacteria in food, especially like E. coli. Right. Yeah, so very interesting. Because leafy greens are more susceptible to yeah. E. coli and bacteria. Do you have anything else to add? I would say start with the biggest pots you can. You're going to have healthier plants, much easier to maintain. Mm-hmm. Use a soilless mix. 
and then start with just a couple. See if you like it. Right. And, <laughs> and then your watering routine is very important. Make sure you don't give it too much or too little. Mm -hmm. So just a, a really, I think it's a nice, healthy hobby. Yeah. I think we got a lot of nice vegetables out of it last year. Yeah. I, we had tomatoes, green peppers, jalapenos that... Jalapeno. ...didn't know that when they stay on the vine too long, they end up turning red and super duper hot. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, we should have a, a podcast on when, Just to, when, to, when to pick this stuff. Yeah, because uh, we didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or the new Spotify mobile app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our book, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, book if, one and two. <laughs> if you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. <laughs> you can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week.